Last week, I dwelt a little bit on the concept of our intimacy with God within the same series of knowing God. And I tried to explain to us how that um, before it becomes our father, it must be your father. That when we come together, we really know we have met him, we have encountered him. Like Jesus will say, you go to God in the secret place, and the God who sits in the secret place rewards you openly. There is, need, there, I mean, there is need for us to have that intimacy with God where we become, I mean, when we see him the way he is and he uh, reveals himself to us. And there is no other way to say it. It is read your Bible, pray every day. It is that consistent handling of God's word, of God's truth. It is that quest to always want to speak to God and hear him speak to us or speak to our heart. Is that drive to be in the midst of believers and be encouraged by what everyone brings. Because the Bible says we are encouraged by the supply that comes from each and every one of us. Hallelujah. That is the way this thing happens. But you see, that is one side of a coin. The other side of the coin is what I want to bring to you. Because some people just go on a tangent that God, there is need for intimacy. That is true. But if, I don't, if we don't teach this other side, you may not really, or not that you may not, you will not have the understanding of who God is. So it is just one level to see God as a person. Now, hopefully, that personal quest to know God will lead you into community. By community, I'm talking about the community of faith or the community of the saints. But if it doesn't lead you there, I want you to know your understanding of who God is can never be complete. Because God in his wisdom has chosen that his knowledge is not domiciled in one person. God has ensured that his knowledge is not domiciled in one person. He has made this knowledge or knowing him to be domiciled in the community. Let me make it clearer. The very first time when I was laying foundation for this series, I told you that God gave us two organs. But this morning, maybe organ is a very heavy word. God gave us two gifts. He gave us the gift of faith. Faith is not something you develop in yourself. Faith is a gift that God gave to you. It's a gift that God gave to you. If you had not given us that gift, it would be impossible for the finite man, for mortal men, to know the invisible God. Because he knows that the capacity for a man to know God who is invisible, who is immortal, is only possible with his intervention. So the intervention of God is the impartation of faith into you. Faith came from God. You didn't develop it. But you see, by faith, the Bible says we understand. That understanding is not complete without experience. So God gave us another gift. In addition to faith, God gave us love. It's love that he planted in our heart. He's different from human love. This is God imparting himself into our heart because God is love. So he gave us a glimpse into who he is by putting love in our heart. And guess what? Through the love that God has given to us, we're able to experience him. I remember, I've not started my message, just trying to break the ice so that we can be on the same level, the same page for the message. I saw one picture one time of a very diligent teacher trying to teach computer, um, computer appreciation in a secondary school. And he was a very good teacher. The only problem is that when we saw the board, he drew the monitor, the keyboard, and the CPU. He drew it on the board, and then he labeled it. This is CPU. This is monitor. Who knows what I'm talking about? Because there was no facility. They didn't have a computer system. So the only way he could impart that knowledge is by drawing it on the board. But can you truly say that those children, they know what a computer is? Yes, theoretically, right? But they don't, that knowledge is not complete until a computer system is brought to the place 
and you plug it to mains, to mains, and you power it, and they can see the functionality. That is when all that the teacher had taught them on the board will suddenly come alive. Because that which was taught them has now come alive because they can now touch it, they can feel it, they can experience it. True faith is like drawing something on the board. But by the love that God has given, we are able to experience him. Who understand what I'm talking about? I want to start my message with a story that originated in India many, many years ago. Many, many years. I think this story existed even before the coming of Christ. But you see, the story has been adapted by many people that I have a feeling that even this, my version, may not be the original version. <laughs> but it still contains the lesson or the lessons that I want us to learn. The story is a parable of six blind men who stayed by the roadside. They have heard about elephants and they have been dreaming of experiencing what an elephant looks like. So one day as they were begging by the side of the road, someone informed them that there is an elephant that is being ridden into town and is going to pass this place. And they begged that once the rider gets to where they are, the rider should allow them to experience the elephant, to feel the elephant. So one morning, that elephant eventually showed up. And the rider was good enough, magnanimous. He stood where they were and allowed these six blind people to experience the animal so that they, can, they could learn what it looks like. The first one touched the animal, but the part that this guy could touch was the side. So he felt the side, uh -uh. and it's like his hand didn't get to the end of the elephant. And so he said, ah, now I know what an elephant looks like. It's like a wall. Because we describe something based on what you have experienced before. Nobody can describe something new. No, you can only describe by comparing what you are feeling or experiencing with something you have ex you, you, you've seen or experienced before. The second guy said, this man, what are you talking about? Because you see, the guy said, you guy, you are mistaken. He was able to touch the tusk. He felt it, the roundness and the sharpness of the tip. And he said, elephant is like a spear. Because he could only touch the tusk. The third person said he touched the leg. He ran his hand down the legs. And he moved a little bit, saw the second leg. And he concluded that an elephant looks like a tree. Because that was what came up in his heart. The fourth man said all of them were wrong. He touched the trunk of the elephant. He felt it very well. He checked it the second time to be sure. And he said the elephant is like a snake, a very long snake. The fifth one touched the air of the elephant, felt it, stretched his other hand, and he got to the second hair of the elephant. And he was surprised by how big the air of the elephant was. He concluded, he said, the elephant is like a huge fan. Because that's what he experienced. The sixth man said all of them were very blind indeed. He touched the elephant's tail. And he ran his hand through the length of the tail. And he said the elephant is actually like a rope. Now the elephant moved on. And the six blind men stayed there they continued to argue, each one believing that what he saw, where they were blind, what they felt, were the correct thing. Who was correct? Thank you so much. All of them were correct. But the understanding of the image of an elephant will only form correctly in their heart 
when they all agree and they put the pieces together to make sense of what elephant might likely look at. As long as they continue to walk in that division, staying on their own lane and claiming to have the total knowledge of who an elephant is, they will never have that image formed in their heart. Is that not so? I'm really praying to God this morning that this illustrates for us what I'm about to teach in the name of Jesus. The positions of many believers, it will amaze you that the knowledge of God that some believers have is the knowledge that has been passed across by their denomination. Do you know what a denomination is? I'm an Anglican. I'm in better this. Me, I'm not an Anglican. No. I belong to the faith movement. You know, so the doctrines that makes one an Anglican and the doctrines that make another a Baptist, the doctrine that makes another one a faith movement has limited the understanding of who God is because God did not form Baptists. God did not form men from Baptists and Anglican. And if you can take it, faith movement. I didn't say faith, I said faith movement. These are creations of men. I said, Pastor, I thought God was the one. Yes, God was working with them. With the cooperation of God, they formed these things. So these things were formed by men. Which means, by dedication, to a denomination, you may like, most likely you are going to miss God. Because many people are devoted to a denomination and they have missed God because God can hardly be found in a denomination. Hey. This will help us. Jesus showed up and he was rebuking the Pharisees. He said, you search the scripture. Because in it, you believe you will find eternal life. He said, this speaks of me. But the fact that you are not accepting me means that what you are searching in scripture is not me. It's something else. Can I say this to you? Many believers search the scriptures. Some are even diligent with prayers. But they have also missed God because they are searching for what? not who. When you open the scriptures, you are not searching for what. What do we believe in Anglican? What do we believe in TBC? Nobody is calling you to TBC or we are calling you a believer. We are calling you to stay with God, with his word. <laughs> Folks, there's a difference. You can meet a man who is very knowledgeable in the word and by the time you sit with that man, indeed, the knowledge of that man is huge. But when you sit with that man, you realize that from A to Z, his knowledge is based on his denomination. Anything outside of it, they don't have it. I don't know why God keeps doing this to me. Give me 1 Corinthians 13.9. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9. For we know in what? In part. And we prophesy in part. First Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. All these scriptures speak to the attitude that we ought to have as believers. Let there be revelations of God in your heart that is coming out from your ears like smoke. You know in part. This is your pride. Lower your shoulders. You know in part. God in his wisdom 
as ensure that nobody has the totality, nobody has the fullness of his knowledge. Now, I need to clarify that. Does it mean that the knowledge of God I have is different from the knowledge of God that Mr. Mori ought to have? That's not what I'm saying. We should have the same knowledge. We should, have, we should know God the way he is, the way he has revealed himself. So that's not what I'm talking about. I started by telling you that there's a difference between God that is revealed from Scripture and God that you participate in. Do you get what I'm saying? I'm bringing the two together to say that is how God is known. So from the aspect of what God has revealed in scriptures, that knowledge is exhaustive. You can capture all that the Bible says about God. It's right there in the Bible. You have the vast knowledge based on the engagement with scripture. Do you get what I'm saying? But as far as the second part is concerned, your knowledge is not full. Is that, is that clear? Your knowledge is not full. So, Let's continue. <laughs> so God reveals himself essentially in community. He reveals himself essentially where? In community. So when a man says, I am tired of church. I have no use for church anymore. The guy perhaps is angry with TBC or is angry with Redeemed or is angry with, give me another church, Winner's Chapel, or is angry with Pastor. Say, why are you angry with pastor? Was he not the one that um, took the lady I was dating from me? <laughs> and so they're angry. People are angry because they don't know the word. You cannot go solo as far as the knowledge of God. So the moment that man says, and some of them appear to be very knowledgeable, I have no use for God, for church. I'm about spirituality. Spirituality is more important. What is spirituality without church? They don't understand. Folks, this is not in my note, but let me say this. Do you know the highest form of punishment in the New Testament? Who knows it? The highest form of punishment that a believer has done something wrong. With excommunication. Now, why do you think excommunication is the highest form of discipline in the church. The reason is because God sits in the midst of the church and he has chosen that community to reveal himself. So, as communicating a believer from that place is to say there is an aspect of God you will never experience as long as we kick you out. But today, is excommunication practicable? I don't know why the pastor doesn't love my face, so me, I'll go to do GC. I don't know all the nonsense they are doing in that church. What did they do to you? I don't know. I mean, I don't want to have anything to do with them. Me, I'm now in redeem. Let me just sit at the back and enjoy the word. Now, the reason why I'm painting this picture to you is to show you how far people have moved away from God. I'm not about church. God can minister to you to leave this church and move to another. Do you get what I'm saying? So we're not talking church here. What we are talking about God, about here, is about God and the pursuit of God. And how potent that is supposed to be. But in our day, that potency is lost. Let me bring another one to you. This one will shock you. A man that is born again is a man that has received the Holy Spirit inside of him. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that scripture we love. If any man is in Christ, is a new creature, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Bible says that man has crossed from death to life. That is how powerful a believer is. A believer is not just somebody who says, I'm a believer, I'm a believer. Mm -mm. A believer is someone, he has crossed from death to life. He is seated with Christ in heavenly places in Christ. He has all of God invested on the inside of him. That is who a believer is. Now, you get the picture? The Bible says, if your brother offends you, go to your brother and make peace. If he refuses, go and take some brethren to beg him. Bro, I came. You did not forgive me. I have brought these brethren to help me beg you. 
The man said, lie, lie over my dead body. He said, go to the elders of the church. Let them beg this, this man. The man still refuses. At the point of the thought, this one is more than excommunication. It's not. I've given you an example of excommunication. This one is deeper. He said, if this man refuses, the church should pronounce that man as an unbeliever. In case many of you are asking me, let me just say this to answer one long question that is in the mind of everybody. People have been asking questions about divorce. On what basis will a church sanction a divorce? You have, you have interacted with the couple. You have done everything. Conflict resolution, everything has been done. One party has yielded. The other party has not yielded. I'm not talking about yielding in small matters. Do you get what I'm saying? I'm not talking about little matters that we believe with time they will work it out. That's not what I'm talking about. The pronouncement coming from this person. You quote scripture, the person says, who told you I'm a Christian? Eh? You say by the Holy Ghost, we beg you. He said, like, like, which, who, who is Holy Ghost? And all that. Now, I'm not talking about just statement. I'm talking about the person has taken a position. And from that point, you could see, this is not of God. And we have waited. We have done everything. The Bible says the church will pronounce that person unbeliever. And guess what? At that point, whichever party, whichever party, that is with the Lord, is free to move ahead. This one will liberate many people. Where is the camera? Which camera is looking at me? I hope you are liberated now. I just needed you to see that. Because many people, this thing I'm saying this morning, they have never interacted with it. And I'm not saying just believe my word. Go back and study. Go back and check. What causes divorce? Is it not fights? Is it not unforgiveness? So why do you think irreconcilable differences? That's what they say. When they have left God out of the equation. <laughs> Let's stop there. This morning, I want to touch on three things to make it very clear. The first one is to show you how that God is community. See, I'm, I'm, I studied English, so... If something does not sound like English, they will make spirit. That's a disclaimer. God is community. The second thing I want to share is that the community, I want to share about the community of faith or the community of saints. And then lastly, I want to share on finding God in community. Now, let's start with the first one. God is community. When I was growing up, one of the first things I learned as a believer is how that God is Trinity. Today is a common thing. People think they believe that God is Trinity, but they don't truly believe. They just accepted what others are saying. How many of us have actually delved into the world to find out this three in one? What does it really mean? How can three persons but one? God is community. He does not only dwell in the community of saints. God himself is community. And the reason when, when he brought forth church, even before the church came, the church in the wilderness and all these other congregation, when God called Abraham out, God did not only call a man. God said, I have called him because he's a faithful man. He will teach his children and his children's children. He called him to become father of what? Nations. Because what comes from God, he has made it that the things that come from him, we mirror him. That what comes from him, we mirror him. So God is not only in community. Before time came, before angels were made, before Lucifer was created, before the entire heavens and earth were made, God is community. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 1, in the beginning, God created, right, the heavens and the earth. But before we go into that scripture, there is something I asked the media team to give me. I don't need my picture. I just want to show them something. You see, many, many years after Jesus left, after the apostles left, 
church came into a situation that was so serious. People started propagating some things and they were calling it the truth. People were saying some things that were against the scriptures. Let me give you a very good one. If you happen to lay hold on Latin Bible, I hope I'm correct. I have a copy. In the middle of it, you have a set of books that are called the Apocryphas. The books were written in a period that can be regarded as the silent years, as if God was not speaking, a dark period. But you see, some people were still writing. And when you come across strange doctrines like a man that dies, certain prayers can be made for that man to cross from purgatory to heaven. It's found in Apocrypha, one of the books. The activities of a man after death and those things that were totally opposed against the scriptures. Because the Bible says it is given for a man who wants to die. After death comes what? Judgment. But Apocrypha says something can be done. So because of all these funny things going on, they came up with something called creeds. Creeds are the summary of what we believe. The summary of what we believe as believers. So that by reciting this creed, we remind ourselves, ourselves of what is scripture and what is not. What is of God and what is not. Do we have it now? So I want to take you through the Apostles' Creed. I finished from an Anglican school. Pastor Benro told you that um, a while back. But what you did not know is that the name of our school used to be St. Matthias Pastora Institute. And it was a normal high school. <laughs> I heard Pastor Benro's laughter. Is he around? <laughs> People were not coming to that school, including me. Because who wants to become pastor? So they were forced to change the name to St. Matthias Anglican High School. People now started coming. <laughs> so one of the things that we used to recite during our service is this, Apostles Creed. Let me take you through it briefly. I thought all of us can. Oh, sorry. Okay. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Is, is it possible? Can't I have everything? Eh? Oh, yeah, let's go. Oh, yeah, church. Okay, we're going to do this. We're going to read this together because it's still valid today. One, two, go. I believe in God. Wait, wait, wait. We are doing it wrongly. We don't read this sitting. <laughs> we read it while standing. <laughs> that is how serious it is. You don't sit down and say, I believe in God. Which God are you believing? You say it on your feet. One, two, go. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Wait, wait. Are they having issues? Okay. I will give you one minute to look for it in your... Oh, yes. Just Google Apostles' Creed. I have my own. Do you have it? You have not seen it because you normally Google other things. But it's fine. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Pastor is not just trying to, to cast you this morning. Have we seen it? Can we go now? One, two, go. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and he seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the only Catholic church. Uh, so, someone says, 
Should we replace that with the Holy TBC? <laughs> the Catholic care means universal, right? So he's talking about the body of Christ. I believe that the church of God is a body, is one. We are the body of Christ. Okay, let's read that again. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hallelujah. You may have your seats. You guys are wonderful. We can summarize the creed with three statements. How many statements? Number one, I believe in God the Father. Number two, I believe in God the Son. Number three, I believe in God the Holy Spirit. That is what the creed is about. Of course, there is, we have the content. Because the Bible says that any spirit that does not confirm that Jesus came in the flesh is not of God. Are you following what I'm saying? That creed is, it looks simple, but it's deep. So Genesis chapter 1, when you look, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You will think that you are dealing with God. Yeah, just one entity. Fine. But by the time you get to Genesis verse 20, chapter 1 verse 26, the Bible says God said, let us make man. That is where our trouble begins. Because it's impossible to translate that scripture from the original to English and say, and use singular for it. Because the Elohim, though one, has distinct personalities. And so when God said, let us create man in our own likeness, someone say, Pastor, I catch you there. The Bible says, I could see the Holy Spirit, I could see God the Father, but I can't see God the Son. Because the Bible says, the earth was without form and void, and the Spirit of God over us, or was hovering over the face of the deep. So I could see the Spirit, I agree with you. I could see God the Father, who started creating him from verse 1, but I can't see the Son. Only for you to come to New Testament. In John chapter 1, verse 1. And he said, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was anything made that was made. You can say that, well, that might still be talking about the father. But we get to verse 14 of it. And the word became flesh. So we, he left us in no doubt that we are dealing with the son. So the son was right there in the beginning. Let me make the first statement. I know that many of us have been studying some of these things and we have come to believe some of the things that they told us because we belong to certain one denomination or the other. That you see, God the Father was the one at work in creation. God the Son was the one at work in redemption. And God the Holy Spirit is now the one in the church age. I want you to remove that from your head. It is not true. I look back at the scriptures. Yes, the personality of God that was brought forward is clear, right? Yeah. Jesus clearly told us, it is a spirit that I go away. If I don't go, the comforter will not come. But that is Jesus in another form. If we understand the concept of oneness, the oneness is not so much as, yeah, there is a singularity to that oneness, I must say. Let me explain it. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, he said, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. The concept of oneness is that we know there is no division among them. There is purpose, union, as in there is one who is doing something that is not leaving the others behind. In all that you have seen from the beginning up to this point, don't attribute it to the Father alone. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit where he, I, have been in union, we continue to be in union, and they did everything together. There is nothing in Scripture. When Jesus was saying that his experience that I go away, the Holy Spirit was present. The Father was present. He spoke about himself. He said, I do not speak of myself. What I see my father do, that is what I do. What I hear my father say, that is what I say. Concerning the Holy Spirit, he said he will guide you into all truth. He said he won't speak of himself. He won't speak of himself because they are one. They are one. They are one. 
It's important we understand this oneness because by the time I now talk about the communion of saints, by the time I'm talking about how that we belong to the body of Christ, you will have a better understanding of the body that you are part of. Because it's a mirror of who God is. God is community. Hallelujah. The last scripture I want to give you before I move on <laughs> can be found in Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Someone is going to tell me this morning, Pastor, really? Uh -huh. It's a simple thing, but you will see it. <laughs> Revelation 4, verse 8. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and needs to come. Question, why not ten holies? Why not five? You think only, only, only is random? To the one who sits on the throne, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, one but three distinct personalities. When you behold God, you will see him in this light. So the concept of oneness of God is that of unity. They are the same in essence, the same in vision, the same in action. There was never a time that the Son of the Holy Spirit did their own thing. That never happened. Hallelujah. We don't have time, so I move quickly to the community of faith or the community of the saints. I don't know how many of you here love sports. You play sports, you... I know Pastor Femi loves um, table tennis. But you see, all the sports in the world, I hope I'm correct, can be divided into two. You can have individual sports and team sports. Is that correct? So if I say boxing, for instance, is it a team sport? Some people may want to argue that. But don't argue with the gods. <laughs> what about golf? What about football? The church is not like boxing. The church is not like golf. The church is like football. No matter how skilled that you are, you need every other part to play their own part, make their contributions before your skillfulness can show. Your skillfulness is not dependent on yourself. It is dependent on what other people are supplying. If Ronaldo does not pass you, no, if they don't pass ball to Ronaldo, there is no scoring, no, there's no goal. And no balo. Uh -huh. I don't know how to pronounce it, but you completed it. Christianity or the church, I must say, sorry. The community of the saint is like football. And it must be seen in that light. The moment we don't have that understanding, that particular point, we start working in error. You see this one that, ah, let me not go ahead of myself. <laughs> we need one another. Give me 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm, I'll just speak one, two verses. I'll move to another one and all that. I just quickly want to show you some things about the church, Okay. Give me 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. What does it say? There are diversities of gifts, but the same? The same what? The same spirit. Yes, verse 5. There are differences of ministries, but the same? Yes. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same what? Who works? 
I don't know how many of you really paid attention to what I just read. Even though he was sharing with us how that in the church we have different gifts but we become one. But do you know he used the Trinity to express that truth? Diversities of what? Of gifts. But the same spirit. Diversities of ministries. But the same Lord. Diversities of activities. But it is the same God. Throughout scripture, I don't have time, but throughout scripture, the concept of Trinity was used to reveal the mystery of the church. To let us know that, don't you understand, this mirrors God. And so when Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 was talking about marriage union, he also had to rely on the concept of Trinity. He said, I speak a mystery of the church. How that what? How that we are, though many, belong to one body. Ha! Though many, we belong to one body. What well, he was drawing on the concept of Trinity. He was saying, the man and his wife, that the two of you shall become one. That concept of oneness is the same concept of God. Behold, your God is one. And I told you that that oneness talks about unity of purpose, the same in essence. Maybe that is too difficult for us to grasp, but let's go back. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created with them. Male and female. From the beginning, God created man as community. He had the option of creating one man. And that's it. He created man and woman. That a man will look at a woman and say, you are flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. But physiologically, are we the same? Some parts of men are flat. Some parts of women have contours. Some parts of men have hair. But today, don't use beard to judge you. <laughs> People are ingesting and injecting so many things these days. I saw a lady the other time, elderly, middle age. I said, I don't know why. I said I had anxiety. And I said it's because... Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a woman trapped in a male body. But you know, you know what? Many years after now when I'm dead and gone, they're going to excavate my bones. And they will look at my bones and say, this is a woman. They won't say I'm a man. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. But the guy said it was too late. They deceived me. He said, even though, sorry, he said, even though she was... <laughs> Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. There are so many things I want to get right today. Am I succeeding in not shouting? <laughs> 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For as the body is one, and as many what? Members. But all the members of that one body, yes? Be many. Are what? One body. So also is Christ. Romans chapter 12 from verse 3. I'm giving you scriptures so that you have something to check when you get back home. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each one. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so is Christ. We, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Each member belongs to all the others. You see this one that you come out, I criticize. I try to correct. But this one that um, unbelievers are having conversations, you are there, and they are 
chewing believers in the mouth. And you are all there and you join them in chewing believers to spit them out. Bible says, think of yourself. You belong to one body. There are certain things that we mock and we scorn and we laugh about that we should be crying. How many of us here right now in church that you scan the church? When I say the church, I'm, talking, I'm not talking of denominations. I'm talking of different churches, Christians, this one, charlatans, all kinds. And then when you finish that, you rebuke this one. You hate this one. You accept this one. You, Bible is warning you and rebuking you. We belong to one body. Don't you understand? We belong to one body. When you see a funny thing in the body, you are ashamed. And that shame drives you to your knee to pray for the church. When last did you pray for the church? When last? You have mocked the church. You have mocked different pastors. You are saying that, even including me, right? And all that. When last did our conclusion get to a point where I need to pray for the church? Lord, cleanse your church. When we ask for revival, let's not deceive ourselves. The revival we are asking for is for our church to become 1,000 or to become a mega church. How many people genuinely pray for revival? And what they are saying is that the power of God, the administration of the Spirit spreads like blankets over the church, judging the people, refining men, and bringing men up who will champion the cause of Christ. How many times did we sincerely pray that way? Do you get what I'm saying? Do we really pray that way? This is the implication. Yet, we read this scripture over and over, but we perhaps we don't understand it. That is what the scripture is saying. We belong to one body, one family. Before we move on to the last point, because I plan to keep to time. <laughs> now, I know that hallelujah was genuine. <laughs> A genuine concern. It's all right. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, from verse 40. The reason why I'm choosing this is because the very first sermon that was made after they received the Spirit. So I can say, after they got born again, the very first message that was preached. I want you to pay attention to their reaction. Those who got saved at the call, what did they do afterwards? Pay attention to it. Because that will point us back to the intention of God for the body. Verse 40. With many other words, talking about Peter, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000. God is community. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Verse 44. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold properties and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, every day, every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The church is the avenue through which God manifests himself. Never underestimate what is going on in this place. I was on campus once. I think I've shared this with you. And one of us was getting, I'm sorry, I was not getting married. <laughs> one of us was having a uh, birthday. And our custom in church is to turn, in, in fellowship then in school, is to turn every birthday to evangelistic um, outreach. Of course, we have fun. We play music, we will dance and all that. But you see the five minutes that pastor will be given. Who was the pastor? Me. <laughs> five minutes that pastor will be given, something will happen. So you see, I always come prepared 
this birthday, deliver the word. About two, three people will join our fellowship. This one, deliver the word. But lo and behold, there was, in, there was this particular one. It was in Sports Center. I will never forget. Sports, sports House. Um, I can't remember the name. Very close. The closest hostel. After that, you have Fajui Hall in the OAU Ife. I was ready. My message was ready. And we're getting set. So as we're getting set, we'll be chatting. We'll be doing all kinds of things. And there was a particular guy who was not a member of our church. But the celebrant said, please, you will help me set up music. So the guy was busy connecting wires, setting music, and all that. I don't know who started the song. Somebody started singing. The other person joined. And then we started singing. We didn't plan to have a worship or anything. We just started singing. But there was something about our fellowship. Every song. We meant every song that we sang. We meant everything that we said. So as we're singing, the guy will later tell us, our countenance changed. I was, we that were chatty, 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 chatty. We just started singing and we left all the chatting. This guy came to the middle of the room, the room, knelt down and began to wail. My message, big pastor, became useless. God manifests himself in community. And we ask, what's the problem? It happened that he was a believer. Was. But at that point, he had left it. He was doing all kinds of things. He had forgotten about God. This was someone that was on fire. He was among the leaders when he was in secondary school and all that. We restored him back to the faith. Who did the work? God himself. How did he reveal himself? In community. In community. In community, folks. In community. Let me share this with you. When we come to church this way, many of you just, some enjoy church, some felt, ah, well, I enjoyed it small. You know, all kinds of emotions, all kinds of feelings. That's okay. That's okay. But let me tell you something you don't know. I sit in my office and I receive people, one after the other. Sometimes they come to encourage me. Pastor, I just want you to know these are the things that have been going on and I'm encouraged when we are done. Other times, I'm the one encouraging. Other times, Pastor is shaking on his seat and I'm trying to veil my emotion because I don't want this person to know that I'm shaking under the weight of what the person is sharing with me. Things that I never thought another human being can say to another person. Things that I thought were so private that nobody would want to reveal to another one. They begin to say it. And when they are done, I pray. You are restored. The power of God is there. And in some cases, prayer is not enough. We pray, we set up structures for accountability. And we say, I'm with you. I will pray with you. Beyond these prayers, I will be with you. I will ask how you are doing. And guess what? I'm still doing that work till today. God reveals himself in community. So what, the way we are seated, don't think things are not happening. Hey! Finding God. Hard to my time. Officially. Otherwise, I will send my God to you. <laughs> and the person says, is it not my God? I agree with you. I'm wrong. You're right. It's our God. Finding God in community. I have started this thought. Many people find God or God. No, let me say it in the negative. Many cannot find God in community because we hate being corrected. One of the ways God reveals himself in community is through correction. So when you have developed this mindset that nobody can correct me, or it's not that nobody can correct you, but anytime you are corrected, you are angry. And the reason why we have not seen you in church for two weeks is not because you were out of town. It's because somebody rebuked you. 
it is ungodly. God reveals himself through correction in community. Nathan, in 2 Samuel 12, confronted David. David was the king. The national prophet showed up and said, you have sinned. But he gave him a parable. And he got, he got the king. And he later found out that he was the one. And of course, he repented. He was rebuked. Jethro corrected Moses in Exodus 18. He said, you will weary yourself and the people. Select men. Why are you troubling everyone? Select men. Don't die before your time. And even though God was the one who sent Moses on, on assignment, Moses will have died. And God will raise another person. And when he gets to heaven, he will receive wisdom. God, why didn't you tap my shoulder? You didn't listen to the people I sent to you. But thank God he listened to Jethro. He listened to Jethro. Let's read this scripture together. Second Timothy. God bless you. Everybody, can you help me sub clap for whoever is behind the time? God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> thank you. I, I genuinely appreciate you. Second Timothy. Now we can read our scripture. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Look at this very well. This scripture. Pay attention to it. Some scriptures. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And it is profitable. That is, we can put it into these various uses. It's profitable for what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Who will bring the instruction in righteousness? Pastor, you are wrong. Not only pastor. Everybody in the community. Who will bring the correction? Pastor, not only pastor, the brethren. Everybody. So when the Bible talks this way, it's not talking to the leaders. It's talking to all of us. The, he said the, 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 the word has the breath of God on it. And it is profitable for correction. It's profitable. Galatians chapter 2, 11 to 14 contains... Paul rebuking Peter. Why did Paul rebuke Peter? He rebuked him because you, in the community of saints, we become the extensions of the word. I will repeat. In the community of faith of the saints, believers become the extension of the word. In other words, the word of God is not only what we dispense or propagate. The word of God is also what we are living. If what we are saying is correct, and what we are doing is not according to what we are saying, we have distorted the image of God. So, Peter showed up in Antioch. And Peter began to eat. You know, they were eating daily. They were fellowshipping. Eating. That fellowship, forget. They were not only... See, all this one that we come together for contact six and at the end we don't eat. It's not really biblical. <laughs> Their fellowship, they were breaking bread. They were also praying. They were also listening to the apostles. Let's make it complete. Don't let's pray alone. I'm not joking right now. I'm serious. Do something. Say, Pastor, we don't have much money. That, that money is God's money. Oh. Sister Bridget, let's spend a little of it. <laughs> Hallelujah. So that, that, that's a joke. So, Peter was eating with everybody. You see, in that church, they had Gentiles. They had Jews. Under Judaism, the Jews they were not mixing with the Gentiles. So, but when Christ came, Christ became showed us the concept of oneness. The Bible says in Ephesians, remember, he broke the wall, of part, the wall of partition between us so that the two of us have become one in Christ. So when Peter showed up, he understood that message. He was eating with Gentiles and he was eating. But certain men came from John. They were Christians, but some element of Judaism was still inside of them. So when he showed up and Peter saw them, Peter withdrew himself stylishly. This is 6 o'clock. By now, Peter will have been gisting with us over a bowl of samosa and some other things. But we are yet to see Peter. 
And when Peter showed up, Peter sat with the Jews. And Paul was like, what is this? Why this discrimination? Before this man came, you were freely revealing how that God is without favoritism, how that God is without discrimination. You were showing us, how come your message has now changed? He didn't say a word, but his actions. So Peter rebuked him. And thanks be to God, Paul re rebuked Peter. Now thanks be to God, because later on we find out that Peter actually listened to Paul's correction. Because in 2 Peter 3, 15 and um, 16, Peter commended Paul. And he acknowledged some of the, the, the gift that God has given to him and all that. Hallelujah. The second thing I want to share is... We find healing in community. I don't know if I've ever wondered why God said, if anyone is sick among you, let him look for the elders. I thought we have faith. I can't I pray? Don't I have? Do they have a different Holy Spirit? Why will he recommend me to the elders? Why am I bringing my matter before the group? Why? Because God has chosen to reveal himself in community. That's why. So you see this thing that you want to keep your issues to yourself. It's not of God. You see this thing that I don't want anybody to know. I don't even want anybody to know about what I'm going through. And continue going through it. I pray you don't die in the process. I'm, I'm not joking and I'm not trying to be hard. I'm telling you the reality of things. There is healing in the community. There is healing in the community. When all of us together, when we pray and say, Lord, I pray for my sister, cancer will not grow any longer in your body. I pray that fry blood is no longer in your body. And we pray it's because there is healing in this community. There is healing in this community. There is healing in this community. In the book of Acts, Herod didn't like Christians very much. <laughs> so he took James. What did he do with James? He did not only kill him. He killed James the way Boko Haram would kill people. He bearded James. When James was seized, the church had not fully come into their own, into the fact that there is healing in our community. So the church was like, ah, uh ah, -uh, they will soon free him. Very soon. Ah, James, don't worry. Um, Madam, James will soon join you. Don't, don't worry. Don't sweat it. James is coming. Pia! The evil king beheaded the saints. The Bible says he saw that it pleased the Jews. So he reached forth and seized Peter. By that time, the church had received wisdom. So the Bible says, as Peter was incarcerated, prayers were made daily on behalf of Peter. And so on a certain day, Peter was there in prison. One hand chained to a Roman soldier, the other hand chained to a Roman soldier. His legs shackled and all that because he was a top, a person of interest to the states. This scapegoat must not escape. So they were watching over him. All of a sudden, these chains, because in the spiritual, I say this by the spirit. In the spiritual realm, everything has life. I will say that again. In the spiritual realm, everything has life. What does that mean? It means that nothing upon the earth will be able to refuse the voice of victory that you dispense from your mouth. And so, the shackles heard the prayers of the saints. And of its own accord, it opened. And the angel came to perfect it, woke him up. Follow me. He thought he was dreaming until he was outside the big iron gates of the prison. 
Folks, there is healing, there is deliverance in this community. What most of us are used to is for people to take mic because people have been asking me, don't worry, a service is coming that it is purely for testimonies. I will make it happen. Pray for me. Many people are used to people coming, saints of God, by the grace of God, I'm giving my testimony. As I woke up yesterday morning, I sprained my leg. And I was surprised by evening. The thing was no longer paining me. Praise God! People give testimony. How often do you have someone come? Saints of God, I am battling with pornography. Saints of God, I've done everything in my power to ensure that my wife is the only one that satisfies me. My eyes roams when I see other women. I have tried. How often do you see people hold the mic and they say that to the congregation? We have moved away from the pursuit of God. That's what I'm telling you. Shame has become bigger than the deliverance of God. The power of God to liberate has become so small in our mind than to the things that we are going through. So we have elevated our situation. We have elevated things. In fact, the shame is not even coming from the spirit. It's on what would people say. You don't understand. A true life story. A brother showed up in church and he explained how he's been battling pornography. Before he came up, about five people had already come up. You don't know why I'm stopping. <laughs> okay, let me continue. <laughs> Lord, I'm unable to fulfill this promise. Only you, you are the only wise God. We, we are limited in many ways. Lord, I failed, but um, your saints have forgiven me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, so, um, that came out and he spoke. For there was a dead silence. The church did not know what to do. When sister came up and shared his deliverance, the church roared and shouted. When the other person came and shared the testimony, the church was excited. When brother came up and he shared his struggles, church was silent. Church didn't know what to say. The pastor suddenly woke up and he went to the stage, held the mic and said, church, can we pray for him and all that? And they prayed for him. And they ensured that they continually prayed for him. A month later, later, they were doing another round of mic testimonies. Brother came up and said, saints of God, I want you to glorify God for me. For the last one month, I have not opened or set my eyes on things I ought not to see. And all that. The church roared. And we're excited. Why is it that we always want to share the end of the process. We don't want to share our struggles. What do you think worship is? When you come to the living God, the Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of unclean people. What's going on in our day? What's going on now? What's going on now, guys? There is healing in this community. And finally... See, whoever is behind the timer, when you show up in heaven, <laughs> your mansion will have five rooms. <laughs> and a fine Christian will be your gate man. <laughs> That's a joke. Oh. That's a joke. We find God through communal encouragement. This one is the last point. I'll quickly just stop it. Um, the first example I want to give is that of Esther. Remember, Mordecai told Esther when a decree came out that was going to destroy the Jews in then Babylon, 
partial, all those areas, and all that. Mordecai said, don't think that you'll be saved. Now that you are a queen, you think you are saved, you are in the palace. He said, if you fail to do something about this, you and your household, you are going. What did she do? Told Mordecai, tell the people, let everybody fast. I will also fast and the people with me. And then I will go into the king. The reason is this. If you show up before the king without being summoned, you are dead. Except the king says, come forward. Otherwise, you are dead. The reason why Queen Vashti lost her position as queen was because the king beckoned, come, to showcase her before the people. She refused. And she lost her position. Are you following me? Esther was able to do that because she received encouragement from the community. I don't know if you can bear this, but you can bear it. I'm talking to pastors and leaders. It applies to every one of us, but this one, where's the camera? Which camera is looking at me? This one? Which one? This one? Pastors. You are not Superman. You are not always the one to give encouragement. Sometimes you need encouragement. Jesus is the exact representation of God's being. That is God in the flesh. Do you know in the hour of grief, when the hour was drawing near for him to be crucified, his heart was heavy. Pastors, the heart of Jesus was heavy. Do you know what he did? He took some of his disciples. They went to the garden called Gethsemane. And out of them, selected, I think, Peter and John. And said, follow me. And they followed him. And he said, stay here. Why I go further to pray? Why was he praying? His heart was heavy. Why did they take Peter and John? He needed encouragement. Our Lord needed encouragement. Folks, this superwoman that some of us are playing, is not of God. As a pastor, I'm not ashamed to disclose to you what I'm going through. Pastor Femi will remember one day I was leading prayers in the morning, very early in the morning. And I was describing how that my heart was heavy. There was a dark cloud, dark atmosphere over my heart and all that. And everybody got worried. People called me. Pastor Femi called me. Femi called me. People were calling me because they wanted to know, Pastor, what's wrong? Do you know why? Pastor should be fine. I love the encouragement. But the thing I want to let you know is that it is okay for pastors to express weakness. It is okay to say, I need help. It does not take away from your position as senior pastor. It does not take away from your position as apostle. It doesn't. I listened to a pastor recently. He said it passionately, but I listened carefully and I disagree with him passionately. He said, some pastors just rebuild their, their lives and they don't know that these people cannot bear the fact that pastor is going through such things, their faith cannot. That's what he was saying. He said, so pastors should not just reveal. Now, I know pastors shouldn't be careless. I know that. But that my humanity shouldn't show in the communication of truth. I have not found it in scripture. If others are not doing it, then we should do it more so that more can come into this. It was in my hour of trial that our father in the Lord, Pastor Dele, was encouraging me. Now, let me not hide. What am I hiding? I was almost divorcing my wife. And the initiative to, for divorce did not emanate from her heart. It came from my own heart. This same man that is preaching. And I remember 20, 2019 to 2020 finished service here. We can call it revival service, crossover service. Powerful. Big three things that you want to pray about. Pastor Effect chose me as one of the three points. God bless you, sir. Finding God through communal encouragement. I believe with all of my heart that his prayers and the prayers of others, because I later heard that Pastor Femi said, Pastors, <laughs> what are you doing? You better pray. This one, church has scattered. <laughs> when I heard it, I laughed. My deliverance did not come gradually. 
my deliverance. When, this is what I call deliverance. I'm no longer divorcing my wife. I will work at it. It did not come gradually. It came in a day. Till today, I believe it was a miracle. Now, it's a miracle because the saints prayed. They prayed for me. And so the alteration of my heart happened because they supported and encouraged me. Pastors, you are not superman or supermen. Let people know what you are going through. And then the rest of us, don't wait until the pastor is sharing his life. And let me wait small. He has shared only 40%. Maybe when he reaches like 80% of sharing, I will start praying. This song, we don't know whether it's sincere yet. Something is wrong with you. You have better start praying. <laughs> start praying for your pastors. Pray for your leaders. We are humans. The same thing you are going through, we are going through it. That time that you are looking at the pump, say, wait, wait, wait. Um, two more liters. Stop, stop. If you sell additional one, <laughs> or this one that you take the note to I said bring the note and you scrape <laughs> there is encouragement there is healing in this community God is in the midst of us look around you this is physical gathering but there is a spiritual dimension to this physical gathering. God told us, and we believe by faith, that he's the one that is here. And the reason why he's here is that he might supply all that we need. That he might supply all that we need. The Bible talks about what every one of us supplies. The Bible talks about a judgment that is coming. That Jesus will sit as a judge. Hear this one. This is the last one. Jesus will sit as a judge. And we separate the goats from the sheep. It is the statement that Jesus made, the illustration that got me. He said, to the one on his right, the sheep, when I was sick, you visited me, the good one. When I was in prison, sorry, you visited me. When I was hungry, you fed me. And the saints will turn to the Lord and say, when did we do all these things? His response will be, as long as you do it to some of these people, you have done it unto me. The greatest commandment in the Bible is Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Thou hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. When they asked Jesus, who ushered in the new covenant? They said, which is the greatest of the commandments? He was quoting this, but he did not stop. He quoted this scripture and now said, the second is also like it. Because the first and the second are the same. He said, and you shall love thy neighbor. As I said, that time that you are dragging 100 naira with the woman selling banana, I want you to remember this scripture. The time that you, 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 you push the woman selling boiled granite until she gave you eight cups instead of six. Think of this one. The time you insisted on having five bolly. Even though your money, based on economic reality today, can only buy three, but you insisted on getting five. You even drag the head of fish to be added. Think of this scripture. I'm not joking. That your mind has not shifted by the word to the realities, to the economic realities, where your disposition, where your not just your attitude, your actions among men reflect that you understand their plight. What God are you pursuing? That's why I used mundane things. I'm using Bolle and Boy Granot. I did that deliberately to let you know that is how God reveals himself. Someone comes to our midst, our words, he doesn't believe. He's a Buddhist or Hindu or a Muslim. He doesn't believe our word. 
But guess what? He cannot deny the love that we share. He can't deny the fact that something changes when we're singing. He couldn't take, he couldn't understand why we just seem to be in perfect union in our singing and in our response, in our rapt attention. He does not believe so much in what we are saying, but he could not deny what we are expressing. God reveals himself in community. Let us pray. Can you be on your feet? <laughs> Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. I want to see. One more time. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. If he's around, I really need him. I want to see you. To see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. He does pause out. Pause your power and love. As we sing holy, holy.
Are you worshiping? song in my spirit is the last one you won't believe I've, I sang it all through last week now I can't remember yes yes that's it yes that's the song exalted 